Hi there, this video is about a LoRa interface which was kindly sent in for review by Reax. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing this right. And I owe them an apology for taking so long to get to it. It's the model RYLR998. LoRa stands basically for long range and is a low data rate spread spectrum radio comms link optimized for low power but still providing a decent range. VX provided the LoRa module in this cute little box, probably to protect the tiny antenna sticking out of it. This is the module out of the box. It's perfect for using on a breadboard with its pin header interface. I'm guessing that a squarish can with a picture of a bird, maybe a dove, printed on it, contains the radio part, while the other side contains the brains in form of a chip. That chip is an M031FB0AE from Nuvoton, which turns out to be a low voltage 32 bit microcontroller based on an ARM Cortex core. Of note, the module needs a 3.3 volt supply and, through the microcontroller, has a serial port interface, which of course also needs to run at 3.3 volt logic levels. To satisfy these needs and conveniently connect to it, I got this very cheap serial interface module from eBay. It uses the FT232R UART chip and pretty much implements this diagram from the datasheet. We have the USB port on one side, which also powers the chip with 5 volts, but actually just the USB interface and an internal 3.3 volt regulator, which has an output here. A jumper allows you to select either the USB 5 volts or the 3.3 volts to be powering the rest of the chip, selecting the signal level of the serial I.O. and it can also feed up to 50 milliamps to power external logic. This chip is obsolete, making the modules very inexpensive, but it's absolutely ideal for this application. Well, almost, because it turns out that the 3.3 volts from the FT232R were not able to power the LoRa module when it was transmitting. So I had to add a tiny separate low drop regulator, the MCP1700-3302, that can support up to 250 milliamps. But since I'm not using any cooling, I hope it doesn't have to. Other than that complication, there's nothing to it. Just the serial module needs to be set to 3.3 volt logic and the RX and TX lines crossed over. That is, TX from the serial module goes to RX on the LoRa module and vice versa. Here's the complete setup just as shown on the diagram. The tiny regulator is almost invisible. The only drawback of the serial module is that it uses a mini USB connector which shows its age. I had to do a bit of a search to find matching cables. Cables? You may have spotted that the bag I showed at the start said quantity 2 because I asked for two modules to be able to test sending data between them. So I built an identical setup on a second breadboard. Reax has documented the method to talk to their module pretty extensively. LoRa and the Reax modules are much more capable than the simple point to point I'm going to try. You can do multi points and there is a LoRa van which I may cover in a future video. The communication uses an ASCII plain text at the default boat rate of 115,200. I have wrote myself a little test program to do that even though standard terminal programs such as PuTTY would do, but I wanted to do that as a prep for more specialized test programs. All commands start with AT. I just want to point out a few special settings. The RF frequency is by default 915 MHz, but in Europe the allowed frequency is normally 868.5 MHz, which you can set using the band command. The RF output power is the maximum of 22 dBm by default, but as it states here, to be compliant with a CE certification, you need to tune it down to less than 14, at least that's how I read it. The guys from Reax however explained that 14 is still within the CE limits. This example shown here is using 10 and this is what I used for most of the tests. So you communicate using AT commands and the module responds with OK. Here I'm checking the parameters because both modules need to be set using the same values. The difference is the address, which are arbitrarily set to 122 on this module. 
Most of these values are stored in flash memory, but the band is not for some strange reason, so after every reset or power cycle you have to remember to set the band again. Bringing in the second module, which is connected to the same computer, but of course on a different USB port, I am checking the same parameters as before. The difference is of course the address, which is set to 123. On this module, I had already set the band earlier and not power cycled since. To test if the two modules can talk to each other, I'm using 123 to send a message to 122. This is done using the send command, followed by the destination address, namely 122, the message length, 10 bytes, and the message. The message got sent and it worked. It is buffered in the module on the receiver. To see it, I have to initiate a serial read, which in my program is done simply by pressing return. The module responds with a plus receive followed by the sender address. 1 to 3, the message length, 10, the message itself, and then the signal strength of the received message in dB and the signal to noise ratio also in dB. To test the reverse path, I'm using 1 to 2 to send the message back to 1 to 3. And indeed it arrived on the other side. The signal strength and the signal to noise are basically identical, as the modules are less than a meter apart. To make this more interesting, I modified my program into two versions. One is called LoRa Ping and the other LoRa Pong. It doesn't matter which one is running on which module, but if one is running Ping then the other must run Pong. In this graphic Ping is module A and Pong is module B. A is sending a message to B the ping. B was checking for received messages and when it finally gets the message, B's lower module also returns the signal strength and signal to noise ratio when that message from A was received. It also returns the length of the received message, but I ignore this in this graphic. B now packages all that data, the received message and its own RSSI and SNR values into a new message that is returned to A. This is the Pong part. A was checking its receiver and so it detects B's message and of course A's lower module also returns the signal strength and the signal to noise ratio when that message from B was received. The effect is that A now knows that B received the ping and it also knows B's signal strength and signal to noise ratio when receiving the ping. A further knows the same values when it received the Pong. This is very convenient because A can now lock the data into a comma separated value file that allows later analysis through a spreadsheet. Both A and B then loop back to do another round of ping pong until they are terminated. This is how it looks in practice. On the right you see 1 to 3 playing the role of B that is pong while on the left is 1 to 2 in the role of A and doing a ping part. The screen for the ping is a bit cluttered because it shows ping and pong data so the messages are easier to see on the pong screen on the right. Each message consists of the word test followed by date and time and then a random number. The two numbers on the very right are the RSSI and the SNR. With that help it might be possible to recognize that ping shows the message received by pong. Pong's RSSI and SNR followed by its own RSSI and SNR. If you look closely on the TX and RX activity LEDs on the serial modules, you can see that data is transmitted and received by both LoRa modules. The whole idea of LoRa is to use little power, so I decided to check that. The meter is measuring the current into just the LoRa module, not the serial converter board. About 17.5 milliamps while receiving. When I start the ping pong program, the values go all over the place. Using the meter's recording function to find the maximum current while sending, it settles somewhere slightly above 85 milliamps, while the minimum during receiving is slightly above 17 milliamps. The module has a sleep mode, which you can control with the mode command. Mode equals zero is what we saw already. This means the module is not sleeping at all. It is trying to receive when it isn't transmitting. 
with mode equals 1, you can make it sleep, which turns off the receiver and transmitter. To make it wake up again, you need to give the mode 0 command. There's also a mode 2 command, where you can set a time to receive, followed by a sleep time, and the module is repeating that schedule. If you want to send something to the module, you need to catch it while the receiver is powered on, or the message will not reach it. I tried that mode but could not make it work properly because my receiver and transmitters are not time synchronized, so my transmitter was hitting the relative small receive window only sporadically. I therefore modified my ping pong code to use a simpler method that just uses mode equals 1 and mode equals 0. First of all, I modified ping to accept a sleep time called Z as parameter. Z is measured in seconds. The only other change for ping was to add the value of Z into the message for Pong and after receiving Pong's reply to sleep for Z seconds before repeating the cycle. When Pong receives the message from Ping, it extracts Z, but otherwise does exactly as before and sends the reply. After that, it uses mode equals 1 to make its lower module sleep and then sleeps itself for Z minus 3 seconds. After Pong wakes up, it uses the mode 0 command to wake up its lower module and then repeats the cycle. On a set of 10 seconds, the minus 3 makes Pong sleep only 7 seconds, so its receiver is on for 3 seconds. I found that works very reliable. With minus 2 it worked most of the time, but sometimes Pong would miss transmission from Ping. This is because both the processing and especially the locking on both Ping and Pong takes a slightly varying amount of time. This is a run of the modified program with 10 seconds of Z time. Ping is on the left, Pong on the right. You can see the 10.0 at the end of the message sent by Ping. Pong also contains a printout of the extracted Z time right below the line showing the received message. So let's see what this does to the power consumption of Pong. Just below 20 microamps in sleep mode. Jumping up to 17 milliamps when waking the receiver up. And going much higher when sending a response and then dropping again to a few microamps in the next cycle. So this works great, just as expected. To measure the maximum current, I have to set the meter to manual range so that the highest power can still be measured. That makes the microamp in sleep mode almost disappear. Transmit is the usual 85 milliamps. This was with a LoRa module set to a maximum of 10 dBm transmit power. Let's try the full power 22 dBm just for a very short time. The receive current is of course unchanged, but the transmit current is much higher, slightly above 122 milliamps. And now the same with the LoRa module set to 13 dBm transmit power. As I said, at that time I believed that was the highest permitted value to stay within the CE certification. I now learned it's actually 14 dBm. Well, for 13 dBm it's just under 100 milliamps, so I guess it might be right on 100 milliamps for 14 dBm. For the next test, I connected Pong to a laptop and started wandering through the house, managing to get about 20 meters of distance, a different floor and several brick walls between the two modules. And Ping Pong was still working fine. As I explained, the lock on Ping contains both Ping and Pong receive quality as long as the responses come through. This is a plot from the recording. It is interesting that the signal strength pretty rapidly decayed but then stayed more or less constant. That flat section here is when I reached the furthest point, put the laptop down and then used my mobile phone to shot the video of the laptop screen you just saw earlier. Not satisfied, I put Pong in a box complete with a USB power bank and a Raspberry Pi to run my Pong program. This setup allowed me to venture out on the street without balancing a laptop and cables and it gave some protection of the very unpredictable weather in the UK at the moment. With Ping behind a window, I managed a distance of about 65 meters, which was nearly all line of sight until the road made a turn and a pretty solid and large hedge got in between Ping and Pong. That was when Pong crashed. Well, it crashed because of my own carelessness in writing the program. Instead of giving me the received message from Ping, the LoRa module returned plus R equals 12, which is a CRC error. 
In other words, the signal got so weak that some bits of the received message could not be recovered and therefore the cyclic redundancy checksum failed. That is totally expected when getting to the edge of the range, but my code had no provision for getting an error instead of a message and therefore crashed. Of course, I have fixed the code and now I'm looking for an opportunity, time-wise and weather-wise, to run more tests and playing with some of the LoRa configuration parameters. I would like to thank Reax Technology for their LoRa modules and for their patience. Their RYLR998 modules are very easy to use and if you are in the need for setting up some low bandwidth, low power data network, I can definitely recommend them. If you like my videos, don't forget to subscribe. There are many more projects, repairs and reviews coming up and it would be great if you decided becoming a Patreon. That would really help the channel. Thanks for watching.